Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Conversation, a series exploring the makings of our exhibitions. In this case, we're talking about deep fakes, art and its double, an exhibition curated by lead curator and director, Professor Sarah Candidine at EPFL Pavilions, Amplifier for Art, Science, and Society at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL Lausanne, an exhibition which was just extended until May 1st, 22. My name is Monica Antohi. I am communications lead with EPFL Pavilions, and today we're welcoming Professor Jeffrey Shaw, a leading figure in new media art, a prolific career spanning across six decades, during which he has pushed artistic creation into new and unexpected ways. Jeffrey Shaw's creative use of digital media technologies lies at the forefront of virtual and augmented reality, immersive visualization environments, na navigable cinematic systems, and interactive narrative. Today, we're discussing a few of his works within the Deep Fakes Art and Its Double Exhibition Framework, including one of his pivotal new media artworks, um, The Golden Calf. The Golden Calf is one of um, Jeffrey Shaw's landmark works in the uh, domain of participatory, interactive, and computer-controlled forms of media art. Professor Shaw has received numerous awards of his critical, uh, uh, for his critically acclaimed work, including the prestigious Ars Electronica Golden Nika for visionary pioneer of media art in 2015. Let's introduce you to Professor Shaw. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, Professor Shaw, and welcome Hello, to Monica. the conversation. No, pleasure, How's it pleasure. going, pleasure. Professor? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it, it's, it's such a privilege to speak with you, um, being such a pioneer in, in, in new media art, being such a pioneer in, in AR um, art. Um, it, it's, it's honestly an honor um, to, to have you with us speaking about this and being part of the Deepfakes Art and Double uh, exhibition at EPHL Pavilions. So um, let's talk a little bit about who you are, uh, because, you know, it, you're 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 pivotal in terms of of anything that's coming out new in AR. You're uh, one of the pillars. Um, so can we give them a bit of, of, of background who uh, into who Jeffrey Shaw is and how did you end up in this field? Because you've been working in this field for sixty years. So um, just about. Uh, <laughs> so what brought you there, and yeah. what's keeping you in this field? So yeah. let's start with what brought you there and what's keeping in this field. Um, look, of course, uh, in any, uh, let's say, a career trajectory, there are um, a million threads which are all interwoven and uh, which are all um, a million threads and a, a million uh, synchronicities. And uh, But um, just... Taking one thread, which I think is uh, probably one of the most important ones in terms of my um, career choices as an artist, um, it goes back to um, art practice, which I launched in the mid-60s, um, where um, the, um, the context yeah, in which I found myself, which was a context of um, object making, painting, sculpture, um, which is not to say that these were not really interesting works, uh, but I saw for myself uh, a need to 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 uh, do something else, uh, mainly because I was uh, disenchanted with um, the um, the relationship, the dynamics of the way in which uh, these art objects were being consumed. You know, they were basically just objects of spectacle or objects of commerce and uh, would be hanging on walls in museums or galleries and people would just sort of walk past them in a, I don't know, in a semi-stupor. And I thought, well, as an artist, it's in, there's something terribly disappointing about, you know, making being involved in a very dynamic creative process and then seeing the outcome of that process as being somehow a very um, sterile and uninteresting sort of destiny yeah, for, for the work that one had created. So I, I started to create works which involved um, audience participation uh, works which uh, which today would be considered to be interactive, though the word interactive was uh, 
sort of almost unknown at that time. But the notion of uh, audience participation was there. Uh, and that was somehow engaging the audience's involvement. And you saw uh, this, if you could even call it a trend in, uh, in theatre. Uh, you saw it also in a way in cinema because I was part of a whole movement called Expanded Cinema, which was uh, also a way in which you know you, one was getting the image off the screen and into the audience and getting the audience to somehow be physically engaged with the uh, with the image space um so um at that time late 60s early 70s i started to do a lot of work with air structures with inflatables uh because uh, this was a medium where a sort of you could call it a sculptural medium that really only came alive if people interacted with it in other words in other words it's giving it form or the forms it took were a consequence of public interaction. Um, and one could also then begin to talk about public co-creativity. In other words, the public themselves were engaged in the co-creation of the, of the artwork. Um, I felt that this, um, thread was fundamentally important and it has been uh, a fundamental to me throughout my uh, a career as an artist mm -hmm. and um, I would say that um, the, let's say a, a certain shift let's say from these air structures and expanded cinema projects of the 60s 70s led uh, quite um, logically and smoothly into ex experimentation with uh, computers um, because um, computer generated worlds uh, let's say or computer let's say computer generated spaces of representation uh, also enabled me to create um, scenographies of uh, of interaction so that and by using computers, these scenographies of interaction could be quite sophisticated uh, and quite complex. So suddenly, the, the 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 world of let's say the interactive space became almost as important as the visualization space uh, from the point of view of conceptually and also aesthetically. Yeah, and. Um, I was very much, in, you know, sort of focused also on the design of the interfaces. That the that the interface itself was uh, part of the work, you know, and part of its conceptual and uh, aesthetic uh, construct. Of course, um, starting to work with computers and starting to work with uh, all the um, the capabilities which. Uh, which computing systems sort of uh, began to offer as they evolved from, you know, the early eighties. I mean, if I think back to, uh, you know, the first, the first important, I would say interactive installation I made was a piece called points of view, uh, mm -hmm. which was made with a, a, a Apple II computer and it's visualization. <laughs> now it's visualization limits. Yeah, uh, this didn't exist. A <laughs> hundred straight lines, right, in black and white at low resolution. And even that couldn't work at, you know, faster than 50 frames, 15 frames per second, oh, you know, in word. real time. So you were basically manipulating simple wireframe objects at 15 frames per second on a low res screen. So there are lots of jaggies, right? But still, it was the dawn of true interactivity. Uh, it was a, 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 the, the viewer basically could navigate a visual world, could change their point of view, could uh, explore a virtual world. And for me, this was a, a really a, a, a sort of breakthrough in what uh, one could uh, be making as an artist, yeah? what, what an artwork could be. 
but of course, over the years, these computing infrastructures became more and more uh, sophisticated. And uh, as a consequence of then that, one's the scope of what one could do as a maker uh, became um, broader and broader. And uh, indeed, uh, we can arrive in what was mid mid 1990s at mm. uh, at Golden Calf, which was the first time that I could uh, explore. Uh, an opportunity, a possibility of working with augmented reality. Again, these terms were almost unknown at that time. But nobody but was the, using them. <laughs> but the principle is there: the principle of being able to create a, um, a virtual object which seemed to live in the real space, so that you would get a conjunction of the real and the virtual. Now, interestingly enough, that principle uh, actually goes back, uh, if you talk about the, the technology of AR, you, it goes back much, really a long time, I think it goes back to the 18th century or something, or 19th century, with something called Pepper's Ghost, right? So Pepper's Ghost was an optical system or an optical uh, strategy of uh, using um, glass or mirror yes. uh, to, to create a kind of ghost image that would float out in, in space. And I think it was also used in Baroque theatre, yeah, where they put an enormous big sheet of glass in front of the stage, and then they would have, for instance, angels in the orchestra pit, and you would see these angels flying around above the stage, right? That's Pepper's Ghost. And uh, Pepper's Ghost, you could say, was, yes, that is AR, the beginnings of AR in the sense that you are augmenting reality with these um, uh, virtual Extra objects. Factors. These, these, yeah, yeah these fabrications. But uh, what happened in the in mid-90s was there was suddenly a technological capability of doing this using computers. So the computer was able to generate the uh, virtual object and uh, com and also computing technologies was able to track uh, the position of your let's say of your viewing device i think this is the big difference between pepper's ghost pepper's ghost had a fixed point of view you know the, the mirror yes. or glass plane was fixed you could only view it from one specific point of view but with golden calf there suddenly is a new opportunity because you're actually holding the monitor yeah. screen in your hands. So you're holding the viewing window and you're able to move around with it. And in that sense, you're able to walk around the virtual golden calf and view it from any angle, look at it from below, look at it from above uh, and discover it as a, 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 a three-dimensional presence. It also overlaps. Should we look at it? Let's look at the one from 1994 because that's that's okay. such a breakthrough. So let's yeah. let's check this one out. What do we have here? <laughs> Looks like okay, a big so, X-ray machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's the pedestal. Yeah, the, the traditional pedestal on which a sculpture stands, and then when you are holding the monitor in your hands, you're seeing a virtual golden calf standing on that pedestal. And as you walk around the pedestal, you are, you are seeing the golden calf from different points of view. And you could see there's a big sort of umbilical cord coming off that monitor because I had to give power to the monitor. I had to give the video signal to the monitor. And also I had to use a fairly sophisticated uh, tracking system because the, a fundamental technological aspect of this work is that you can track the position of the monitor and adjust the image accordingly so that the computer knows where the screen is in relation to the real world pedestal. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's a cable in the, in, in, the, uh, in the umbilical cord that actually carries that signal. And if you look just below the monitor, you can see hanging off the bottom of the monitor, there's a, a sensor, yeah? 
mm. which is actually doing this uh, this tracking. It was an absurdly expensive uh, undertaking because I think it was around ten thousand US dollars just for that, just to be able to track um, the. the uh, yeah, the, the monitor at that time. And also, this was before the days of tablets, right? So you right. could this only a, use a small is monitor. Is this a TV monitor? Is this a TV <laughs> yes, screen? Exactly. What did you have there? <laughs> but actually, this gave it a certain uh, magic and a certain yeah. power, uh, which is no longer familiar to us. And that is, in those days, uh, screens were not something that you took in your hands. No, screens no, were no. fixed objects. They were either on a wall or they were on a table. But nobody at that time imagined that you pick up a screen and hold like it in that. your hands, you know. And now it's, of course, an ubiqu ubiquitous experience with, with tablets. So just that, that um, situation where the viewer was invited to pick up the monitor, to take, to, to, take physical possession of the monitor and uh, and then be able to move it around dynamically in space. This had a very special feel. Here you can see this guy, you know, lifting the monitor slowly because <laughs> it's just, you know, just lifting the monitor itself was, you know, just a very radical experience. Um, in fact, there's so much about the early days of computer graphics, which uh, is it has this magic of... Uh, of you know first discovery of uh, first experience, um, sometimes difficult to find that again today. <laughs> yeah, the beginnings yeah. Of, of of certain experiences. Um, I even had to put little signage on the on the screen, you know, instructing people to take hold of the monitor, because uh, otherwise it would just lie there on top of the pedestal and. Uh, probably, you know, sort of be imagined to be a sculpture in itself. Mm, um, um, the, the next one, the... Really what's important about this work also that it's performance. In other words, if you say what is the golden calf as an artwork, the golden calf is the viewer discovering the golden calf. It is the viewer moving around with the screen in their hand. If uh, So... The Golden Calf is the performance of the work. And this was also a very, very important principle for me in practically all the work I've done uh, when I'm talking about interactive work. And that is the work is its performance, is the way in which it is brought to life by the viewer. And each viewer, of course, does something different. You can watch the work take a different form and different shape depending on how people are handling the work. And uh, actually, I can enjoy my own work in this way, watching people explore the work and seeing each time different strategies of, uh, of, um, of uh, exploration. You know, some people are impatient, some people are disinterested, some people are fascinated, some people lock into one thing and ignore something else. It's, it's, there's a wonderful variability in the way people in a way, take possession of the work, make it their own. The, now, of the, course, the this thing. is also happening in the world of painting and sculpture. You know, if, if you're standing next to someone and you're looking at uh, Picasso, you know, there's a lot going on in that person's brain and in that person's sensibility and in yours too. But it's invisible. You don't see what that person sees. Yeah. And with these works, in an odd way, you are kind of like a voyeur. You actually get to see the work through somebody else's eyes. You see how they see it. And this is quite, this is also fascinating for me, a fascinating aspect of the way these artworks come to life. All right. So we're looking at the Golden Calf, the okay, new we're version. At the Golden Calf today, recently remade. Of course, we are now in the era of tablets, so using uh, iPad. Um, and, of course, the iPad has all kinds of new capabilities, so uh, I no longer have to use uh, a separate sensor, uh, but I can use, the, uh, the, I can use optical tracking uh, that's, that's available to me from uh, the uh, functionality of the iPad. So I'm using software called Euphoria, which is 
AR off the shelf AR software. And if you notice now that the the top of the pedestal has a a, 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 a marble, marble. It's, yeah. it's a marble top. The marble is there, of course, also to evoke, you know, a kind of uh, memory or aesthetics of the marble pedestal. But actually, the marble is functioning as a euphoria marker, like a QR code. And so the camera on the um, on the uh, iPad is actually looking at the pattern of the uh, of the marble, and uh, and it uses that as a visual reference so that it will understand. What the orientation of the uh, of the um, iPad is, and what its position in space is. So suddenly we have really a whole bunch of new, sophisticated technologies, which are off-the-shelf technologies that one can uh, leverage. Uh, also, there's another functionality here, which uh, uh, brings a new dimension to the uh, you could say the AR or the mixed reality of the golden car. Because uh, in this work, I've got uh, video cameras uh, built into the pedestal. You can see the little dots. Yeah. Uh, there are four video cameras which are seeing a kind of spherical view of that room, which means there's a video recording of the people who are looking at the virtual golden calf, and they can see themselves reflected into the skin of the golden calf. So you have another layer of this paradoxical mix of real and virtual, because now the the real world uh, is not just the pedestal on which the golden calf is standing on, but it's also the real time view of the viewers themselves as they view the golden calf, as they walk around the golden calf, being reflected on the skin of the golden calf. And, and, and that's spectacular because it's a digital piece. So you don't expect to see the reflections of yourself or the people in behind you or around you onto this digital object, but it's yeah. there. And it's, it's to me, that was one of the most shocking things about the piece. Well, besides the fact that it's, it's so amazing and, and, and just looking at it, the, the fact that it's you're incorporating everything around it and you're, you're, you're making the audience part of the experience, not just by holding the, the iPad, yeah. but by, by literally being involved with what's yeah. being shown on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but why so, the uh, golden calf? Let's talk, <laughs> about, let's talk about why did you choose the golden calf and, and okay. um, how did that come about? Like, come on, because a calf, like, you know, like, why is it this little, little golden object that, you, that, that that caught your attention? Well, before we get to the golden calf, let me also say that this work, in a way, plugs into uh, selfie culture. Because, you know, these days, if you go to a museum and you look at artworks, it to be, you know, to complete this the, the circle, you need to stand in front of it and have your photograph taken next to it, right? <laughs> so the amalgamation of your of the evidence of your presence, right, is now almost, you know, sort of a, a necessary aspect of any uh, art experience, yeah? So that's also reflected in this work in a, in a sort of on another level, you know, that that your, uh, your presence is there. And actually I've seen people taking photographs, right, so they're taking selfies of their own reflection in the golden calf as evidence of their presence in the in the in the work okay the golden calf where does it come from well it comes from two places it comes from the bible yeah uh, and uh, as a, as an object it's a, an object of um uh how to say of a, 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 a false god right it's yeah. uh, and um, Moses, of course, was very, very upset when he came down from the mountain uh, with his tablets and saw everybody worshipping the golden calf instead of waiting and being patient for uh, the, the authentic voice. Yeah. And uh, he smashed the golden calf. And, of course, the golden calf also represents, it's both an animistic object and it's also gold. You know, it's the worship of of material things. So the golden calf is indeed an interesting sort of icon of, um, of something one should, shouldn't worship. 
So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of golden creatures here in Hong Kong, I promise you. I mean, if you're looking for good luck, <laughs> if you're looking for good luck you go out and buy yourself a little golden pig or something. So it's still, it still resonates, yeah, the, uh, the, this sort of, uh, indeed, this animistic uh, conjunction with the uh, precious metal. Um, but said, okay, so the golden calf is this, is the false god, and now uh, 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 I've, I've reenacted the golden calf as a virtual golden calf. So there's a little irony in there, there's a little paradox too. So now we have a golden calf that's immaterial, right? What does that mean? You know, uh, is it something that we can rethink about? You know, is it now, has it become worshipful now that it's, become immaterial is that possible and also it's a it's a, a wonderful construct of uh, computation of computing technology it's a bit of magic right totally fascinating and we are fascinating with we are fascinated with technology yeah we it's it's deeply in you know sort of um uh, deeply integrated into our life experience yeah so in a way the golden calf now becomes a, a, a kind of a, you know, a, a sort of an expression of that, of our fascination with technology. But is it a, is is the technology now then false god? Okay, so it, it sort of plays with this uh, these uh, questions. I, I think mean, we can start a new religion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but false gods are very attractive, yeah. And this one certainly, and technology is very uh, attractive too, and and very. very has enormous virtuosity in terms of what it can do. Um, the other aspect of uh, of this golden calf, which uh, I've, which interests me uh, from the point of view of uh, you could say from point of view of art history, yeah. is that it's a found object in a sort of Duchampian sense. And in fact, a few of the works I'd like to talk to you about today have this this characteristic of being. Uh, of um, actually uh, being objects that are out there in 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 the in the in the culture. So at, at that time, which was mid nineties, I remember I'd been able to purchase or get access to a, a sort of next generation silicon graphics machine, and it had demos built in to to show you what it could do. And that particular generation of um, silicon graphics machine had um, specific capabilities in terms of texture mapping. Yeah, this was a new feature. Uh, you know, computers before that, if you built a three-dimensional object, it was just a sort of flat shaded thing. And then with texture mapping, you could say, okay, let's make it wood or let's make it marble or let's make it, uh, you know, grainy or let's make it reflective. Or So you could add texture yes. to, to surfaces. And this was, of course, you know, very... Uh, a very powerful resource, a very powerful um, um, creative tool. Uh, so they had demos to sh to dem to show you that well, you know what the machine could do because they were very proud of this feature, and you could choose different objects and then you could attach different textures. And uh, so you know a typical object might be a teapot, uh, but then suddenly there's a cow, right? Cow was there as one of the objects that you could play with. So I had a cow on the screen. And then I thought, okay, here's my, you know, little library of textures, you know, wood, I had a wood cow, and then marble, I had a marble cow. And then suddenly I've pressed gold, and I've got a golden cow. And I'm looking at the screen, and I'm saying, wow, I've got a golden cow, I've got a golden calf, right? <laughs> and, um, and that was the moment that I thought, I, I must do something with this. Yeah, this is the golden calf that has emerged out of this machine right and um and that led i don't know what the you know it led to the formulation of this uh, of this artwork and actually if you look closely at the golden calf in its first iteration you will see it's not a calf it's a cow no exactly it looked it looked, <laughs> it looked kind of large because uh, it it's a cow you know because that's what i was given this time round of course uh, situation 
Uh, lost, now, lost now about 10 thought, years. <laughs> now I thought, okay, now I need a golden calf and I'm and I can just Google on 3D models of golden of calves, right? And just choose the calf. So once again, it's a found object, the calf. I just go to a library of 3D objects and, and find the, the nicest looking calf. And then I attach the gold uh, texture to it. And now I have a golden calf. <laughs> it, it, it's beautiful. I like the, the evolution through time. The, you, know, you can see the, the work that was done and that, showing that video, because you can talk about something that's happened in the nineties and, you know, talk about the fact that you lifted a screen and yeah. you, you talk about it from our perspective today, but yeah. seeing it, you know, realizing that, wait a second, and 90, in the 90s, you wouldn't lift a TV screen like that. We didn't have flat screens back then. I don't remember flat screens in the 90s. I might have been wrong, but I thought, I think that that was a 2000 something um, uh, situation, um, in, you know, invention. But lifting a TV screen, uh, moving that around, seeing something that doesn't exist, mind blowing. Uh, for the 90s. Um, the iteration now, it's mind-blowing for other reasons, and it's growing, and it's the, the, the technical, and I, I, I would like to see it, I don't know, in another 10 years or another 20 years to see what kind of technology spin you can put on it and which kind of new life you're going to bring into it. Um, I'm super excited about it. It could be, you know, it could be just, uh, you know, hologram at that point. I don't know where technology is going to take us. I don't know where you're going to take us. So I'm super <laughs> excited about the, the evolution of the, of the golden calf. Um, so and, and maybe it'll start a religion <laughs> on its own. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looks like the golden calf is, you know, has a certain level of immortality, right? It just mutates <laughs> in terms of in terms of new conditions. But certainly, yes, one of the differences now is that the uh, that a tablet is a ubiquitous object. So now the pleasure of the work is to discover that this tablet, which is a ubiquitous familiarity, yeah is able to um, open a window to this magic, yeah? Um, and uh, so it, the dynamic is different, but it's important dynamic. It's important now that you are handling something which you handle, which a lot of people handle every day uh, as, as, a, as a path into the artwork. Uh, whereas in the first iteration, uh, the path into the artwork involves the disruption of a familiar relationship that you have with screens, yeah, and the uh, the opportunity to see a screen and handle a screen in a completely new new uh, new dimension. Talking about screens, <laughs> let's jump us to um, to Pure Land. You, um, within the Deep Fakes Art and Double exhibition, you have multiple works. Uh, Golden Cap is one of them, and it's pivotal in, in many, many ways, like we've, we've touched upon a little bit. But um, I would like to talk a little bit about your cooperation with, with, with Sarah Kennedy, with Sarah, mm -hmm. with our, our lead creator on Pure Land. Um, it's, it's, it's a work that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you, you both worked on, but it's 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 heavy with AR. It's it's AR. Um, so can we talk a little bit about that uh, and what it is about? And and do you, you know, um, do you want to do the? Should we do the video first and then talk about it so we give a bit more of a background to the to the conversation? Yeah, I, I actually, Pure Land is is um, is. Uh in a way a logical extension and it's also a very uh, it's also very um yeah it's within you know this the sphere of what augmented reality is all about uh, in, uh or computational augmented reality um if we see it as a as a step um uh, beyond or going forward from golden calf. So the golden calf, basically you're using a window mm. to create a virtual view into the real space. And you are seeing a golden calf, an object on a pedestal, which you can walk around. Now, the paradigm for um, Pure Land is that you are using, again, the tablet, the screen as a window. But now 
you are inside a all surrounding space, which is one of the caves at Dunhuang, and you can basically use this window, this AR window, to explore that uh, that cave space to see it all around you. So you create um, the virtual environment. It's, it is all around you, and it's one-to-one -one scale all around you. And then you, the window basically uh, lets you see that. Yeah, Actually, it's an interesting paradigm because it's not that much different to the way we experience the world anyway. You know, I mean... We are. Very much like that, yeah. Our eyes have a certain angle of view. And outside that, we have peripheral, you know, we have our peripheral vision, of course, which is a lower resolution. But if you think about it, if you step into a room, okay, that you've never been in before, the first thing you'll do is just look around and you'll build a kind of mental picture of the room. Mm, but much. from that moment on, you don't need to look around anymore, you know, because you've, in a way, captured the tip the, the the totality of the space, you understand the space. And from then on, you are just focusing your attention where you want to focus your attention on the things that interest you. And in a way, this AR device does something similar. Initially, you will take the tablet in your hand and you will look around a lot so that gradually you will, in a way, um, tile together the totality of the space in your uh, in your uh, in your imagination so that you have a picture of it and since the space is one to one scale and you are walking around in it it's your body also that is telling you you know what how the space looks and where its boundaries are and, uh, and what its scale is so um in that sense it's an it's an interesting approximation of how we actually um, perceive and uh, and uh, experience the real world. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and, and this in this case particularly because these caves are they're caves, so there's very little to none uh, natural light. So you come in there, and this should be kind of what you're looking at because it would be kind of like what you're looking at through, like if you would have a, a flashlight. Yeah, exactly. Or, so. Exactly. The, the the rest is is darkness uh yeah, yeah. yeah you just, still have so, a the vague sense of what's around but yeah. you walking into these caves and um the mogao caves and and you're you're there but you're even if you're there i don't think that your try. experience would be yeah, yeah. No, absolutely much different yeah absolutely. um yeah. Let's take a look at the video to see kind of sure. what that looks like and then we'll 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 continue talking through it. Yeah. So uh that's that's the the darkness <laughs> that we were yeah. talking about. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And uh, so we did build three walls uh, to basically create you know set the perimeter because we don't want people to walk through the walls of the cave. So when you actually move the the screen and touch the surface of the of the physical wall in the space, you're actually touching the the wall of the cave itself, and you're seeing the painting on the wall one to one scale. Yeah. So at the at moment when the screen is actually in contact with the surface of the wall, you're in contact with the uh, the virtual cave one to one scale, seeing its painting, and. Um, this, uh, how do you say, synchronization of these two spaces, of the virtual cave space and the real physical space, uh, and the fact that you're walking around in those spaces and exploring that space using this uh, uh, perceptual window, all of this creates a very, very strong sense of, um, you could say, reconstructed reality or of... Mm -hmm. um, reconstructed experience and um, you can see also that it um, attracts a lot of attention um, 
<laughs> Clearly, there's there's pictures. Yeah. There's uh, you have the woman holding the the, the iPad. Yeah. Then you have yeah. people taking videos of her with the iPad on. Then you yeah. have somebody else taking a picture of the woman taking a video of the person holding the, yeah. the iPad. So it's, again, we're we're back to the golden calf. Quite honestly, technology as a kind of golden calf, utterly fascinating. Yeah, uh, we are. We are looking at the Mughal caves. We are enjoying the Mughal caves, admiring the Mughal caves, but that enjoyment is amplified, right, in a way, by the magic of the technology, which allows you to view it and experience it in this way. These caves are not accessible to the public anymore. So, um, due to conservation issues, due, due to actually deterioration issues, and yeah. you know weather and people and and um, we could completely destroy these caves if if we allow um, access to the public yeah. basically to, to to come in there. So, well, by by doing this, you're yeah. saving heritage. Um, it's cultural heritage. It's it's art. It's uh, it's worldwide heritage. It's not just local heritage. Yeah. Um, and but it's it's beyond that it's beyond you saving heritage with with yeah. this it's uh it's this level of interaction that we're talking about it's this um, selfie um thing that that you're bringing into it uh, as well um yeah so it's yes definitely it uh, you know i mean this particular cave indeed is not uh, uh, not accessible to public uh, for for a number of reasons, other caves are open to the public. But it's true that every visitor to the real cave contributes to its uh, to its destruction, actually. And uh, the uh, the uh, people who are looking after the caves are very cautious, uh, allowing limited number of vi visitors, only opening a certain number of caves at any one time, and and cycling from one cave to another. Um, and there's also no doubt that, you know, you have to go there to Duang, Dunhuang, you have to fly there, you have all the issues to do with, um, you know, with uh, sort of climate change related issues uh, to do with expenditure of, uh, of energy and fuel, etc. So, look, in general, uh, you know, both Sarah and I are deeply committed to uh, strategies for, you could say, the surrogate experience of cultural heritage and also creating experiences which have their own dynamic, their own fascination and their own information. This work is extremely informative. It tells you a lot about that cave. In practice, you're probably seeing more, yeah, as you said earlier, just shining a little torch around doesn't show you very much. But with the iPad, you're, you're actually seeing more than you would see if you would visit the real cave. Uh, and it also and has it's a certain... better experience. It's a better experience. You're you're one to one instead of being one of thirty yeah. people or twenty people walking into that cave. You're you're able to to go very close to the wall and see as yeah. as close as possible. Uh, yeah. Plus, there's like some some Easter eggs through yeah. through the exhibit through the yeah. installation itself that make it yeah. a bit more. Yeah. So. It doesn't, I mean, none of these strategies replace the real, you know, the golden calf, the virtual golden calf doesn't replace the real one, <laughs> wherever that is. Uh, um, and um, the uh, the virtual Dunwan cave doesn't replace the real one, but it does something else. And it offers the cave to people in, in now in Lausanne. It has traveled all over the world. People have been, have visited Dunhuang through our installations at so many different places in the world. So there is also this this capability uh, of the digital um, reconstruction, reproduction of of the deep fake, right? Yeah. To uh, to uh, to bring these experiences to to people all over the world. Um, even, I mean, quite honestly, uh, something like the uh, the the, um, the Dunhuang Cave, one could even download it uh, and just view it at home. You could actually walk around your ha house, you know, with with your iPhone and uh, and use your iPhone as a window into the Dunhuang Cave. So you could transplant it into your living room. Uh, these are all interesting 
um, capabilities that the the, the current technologies uh, um, are offering to us, and mm -hmm. um, and certainly uh, less visitation is going to lead to uh, a much longer term conservation of these uh, of these. Um, wonderful sites. And you have extreme case, for instance, with Lascaux, with the caves of Lascaux, which are completely closed to the public. They have been for years. Yeah. And now when people say, oh, I've been to Lascaux, what they mean is they've been to the deep fake Lascaux. They've been to the reconstruction of Lascaux. But the reconstruction is very good. And, uh, and serves uh, the same purpose. I think the only people who need to visit the real cave are, are probably archaeologists. <laughs> yeah, archaeologists and art historians who need to uh, see some peculiar detail which is not evident in the, uh, or, uh, in, in the reproduction. Mm -hmm. and, and talking about um, these things that not a lot of people have access to, um, you, you I want to take us to the Virgin of the Rocks um, and, and what that means for you and, and how that fits with all of it. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Well, the Virgin of the Rock, again, at a certain moment, you know, if you are building, uh, so the Dunhuang Cave is a three-dimensional space and yeah. you, can, you can explore that space. Uh, and then at a certain moment, we were asked to do a work for an exhibition uh, uh, on Leonardo da Vinci. And then we are looking at a painting and thinking, well, can we also enter the space of the painting? And especially this particular painting of, of, of Leonardo has got an extraordinary environment behind the, the main it figure. Does. Yeah, It's this fantastical cave with rocks and plants and a wonderful vista out to the to some lake or mountains it's it's an extraordinary scenery and it's leonardo you you expect that from him <laughs> you have to yeah so then we thought well why not you know as, as a way of presenting this work why not give people the opportunity to to actually enter this space which means to go behind the figures which are in the foreground and simply explore that cave for what it has to offer. So uh, here we, we, we went down, a, a um, you could say, an interesting path. We started to work with a, a game a developer, someone who builds virtual worlds for games. And we said, well, look, here is the painting that Leonardo has made. Um, let's use that as a starting point to try and model that space in 3D. Um, and then we also said, uh, we also established certain parameters. We also said, okay, we're going to exhibit this in a room and we're going to make the room, uh, let's say, eight by eight meters. Mm -hmm. So we're going to model um, Leonardo's cave inside an eight by eight meter space. And um, so that's that's how the work was actually constructed, yeah. And uh, and we tried as faithfully as possible to to reproduce the aesthetics and the atmosphere of uh, of Leonardo's uh, cave. Now, what it means in practice for the viewer is that they enter a, a, a room. We can, actually, if you like, you can show the video. Let's show it. So again, we're using a, a tablet as a kind of magic window. Uh, we are tracking the tablet, so we know where the tablet is in space. We see the figures in the foreground, life-size, and we can walk behind them. And that space behind is the space where the 3D model of uh, um, Leonardo's cave is located. And simply by moving the screen around, uh, you can explore that cave. Um, this I would like to see. Like I would like to see all of <laughs> them, but this one is, um, yeah. Yeah, and um, you see, there's a curious wireframe thing on the floor. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a, a sort of irony because it's actually the 3D model of the cave as a wireframe model projected on the floor. 
So in a way you're saying, well, this is the cave space that you're walking around in. And also we had another sort of little challenge, and that is what do you see when you look back? Yeah. In other words, when you look back at those figures from behind mm -hmm. and are looking at the space in front of those figures because Leonardo never told us what that space looks like. So uh, if you look now again at the video, you'll see how we resolve that uh, sort of conundrum. Uh, what we did is we created a mirror image of the cave space, but this time we just left it as a wireframe. So it's almost like you're seeing the cave space mirrored. There it is. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's the cave yeah, space yeah. mirrored, and that, that cave space is beyond in front of those figures. But now it's just seen as a as a wireframe. So it's 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 an aesthetic strategy to basically solve a problem, which is we know what's in behind those figures, but what what will we see when we look, turn around and look at the figures from behind? And we see the figures there as a cutout, yeah, as a shadow. Yeah, you're seeing them from behind, yeah, yeah. and then in front of them you see the wireframe configuration. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat uh, idiosyncratic reinterpretation of uh, Leonardo's um, painting. It, it's spectacular, and um, it's um, and and this is another way of doing AR uh, because you have the one where there's a static object right here, and we're moving around it. This is yes, we're moving around it, um, like we're moving in the uh, Dumont caves. Um, but it's 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 still a bit different. It's still something else. Uh, it's still another version, another evolution of, yeah. of AR. Because in a way, the Dunhuang Caves is faithful to the original, yeah, because the cave is there as a cave, and we have modeled it one-to-one -one scale. Whereas the Leonardo piece is a, is a, is a fiction, yeah? It's a mm -hmm. fiction that has been, you know, sort of... Um, built around or, bi or built from the the painting and, yeah and it's stunning um it, it's stunning what's next after what what was next for you after virgin rocks um did, did you jump directly into safe house or uh what was that like did you, how did you end up in safe house <laughs> so look one thing I can say also about one a trajectory. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's say an artist. Well, I think every artist's trajectory, and that is typically you can you you can always see how, in a way, one work follows from another. Even mm -hmm. if you look at the oeuvre of a painter, you will see a kind of progression. Uh, it's a progression because in each work, certain ideas are worked out. And at a certain moment, once those ideas worked out, you open the door to another set of possible ideas. So one idea, in a way, triggers another idea. Or one, you know, let's say strategy of interaction or one strategy of visualization suggests uh, another strategy or a variation. Yeah. Uh, and certainly uh, during this period, these years uh, from, you know, from let's say even from the golden calf until the present, is that there is a line of development uh, in this exploration of, um, of AR, augmented reality, as a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of artistic resource, as an as a, as a aesthetic resource. So, and as you're working with these materials, you get more and more familiar and you see more and more... Um, you see some more and more of its potentials, yeah. So Safe House actually grows out of that experience and also out of, um, I'm just trying to remember what the idiosyncratic moments were that led to that formulation. Um, actually, uh, Sarah can tell you a little bit about that because uh, the lockers that yeah. are, are actually the lockers at EPFL. They're the lockers at... Uh, <laughs> at, um, at the entrance of people at the, yeah. yeah. It, because I remember Sarah and I, you know, early early days, sort of, uh, we, I don't know which exhibition it was, but we were, 
thinking it you know, we're thinking about exhibition making in the space and we're looking at these lockers and think you know aren't they're pretty monumental all these lockers don't you we can probably do something with that you know and then at a certain moment you know the notion came up yes let's you know open the doors virtually and see what's inside and Sarah built a work uh, uh, for a pre for a previous exhibition yeah. um, on that idea so she basically launched the uh, the idea of using the lockers as an a uh, artwork and then that overlapped with my an exhibition here in uh, in hong kong uh, where for some reason or other well it, it overlapped with another work uh, we had made which was called the the divine comedy i, I won't go into that into any uh, detail but actually Safe House is a hybrid of two works. It's the work which Sarah made at at, at uh, EPFL, and then the work we made here called the Divine Comedy, and then these two came together to create Safe House. Okay, <laughs> let's play Safe House. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know, as I said, these things are all overlapping. So there's the set of lockers. Uh, Again, you pick up an iPad to uh, uh, view these lockers, and now the iPad, you know, actually, as soon as you look at a door, the door will open, and you see a figure inside, and the figure is doing That's something. not you, right? No, it's not me. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> it is not me. It is um, an elderly fellow. And in another locker, you'll see an elderly lady. Again, these two people are found objects, like, uh, as I was telling you earlier, uh, yeah. gold, golden calf was a found object. Um, because I just need, I just wanted a male and female, I wanted an elderly male and female figure. That was the starting point. Um and I just went online to one of the uh, libraries that you there's there are some really good libraries for 3D models that you can animate. And uh, though it was a little difficult to find an elderly couple because uh, most of these figures are are sort of young and athletic yeah, because yeah. they're mainly designed for video games or whatever else. But I found a good elderly couple, and they needed to be elderly because, of course. In a way, the elderly are the most um, fragile in relation to to COVID, um, and also I wanted um, I don't know just being elderly myself. I thought I need to be able to talk about people of my age rather than um, than you know bring them into the into the work rather than uh, than uh, youngsters. Um, so we have this elderly male and female figure, and they live inside the these lockers. Um, virtual lockers. In these virtual projected lockers. Projected on top of yeah. Projected yeah. on top of real lockers. And and you see the lockers have a curious sort of texture on them. This sort of pattern. Uh, the pattern is important because the pattern, again, functions like a QR code. Um, you remember I told you about the golden calf and how the marble yeah. pattern. So here again, the, the 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 image on the locker doors is a specific pattern, and the iPad camera recognizes that pattern, and so understands what's behind that door. Yeah, it it basically is a sort of an identifier for each locker. Uh, but that pattern actually is COVID virus. It's uh, uh, it and, is. It's a um, microscopic a microscope view of the COVID virus again, which I just found online. At one stage, I wanted to actually etch the virus into the steel of the uh, locker cabinet, so it was would be as if the locker cabinet itself was somehow infected with the uh, wow. COVID virus. But quite honestly, it was a financial and time issue and, and I sort of compromised and just made a print and just stuck the print on the uh, on the doors of the uh, of the locker. Maybe one day uh, later on, if I make a more uh, luxurious version of this work, I will actually etch the um, the uh, the virus pattern into the into the steel of the doors. Um, so you've got a locker and it's, you know, the virus is basically, uh, you know, uh, there and these people are protected on the inside. 
um, and they are exercising. I mean, they're in a way you could say they're in kind of isolating quarantine in these lockers. They're in quarantine. They look like they're in quarantine because I don't see them interacting with each other. They're very safely close into their, you know, tight little cubicles. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, they've got to, you know, they need to do something. So again, it's in a in the sort of uh, Duchampian tradition. I went online and I searched for libraries of um movements which are in this case movements from video games right so these are big libraries uh, that you can purchase not too expensive and it's a library of of gestures and movements that if you are a game maker you can assemble these for a typical video game right and actually if you look at them closely you'll probably recognize some of them you know like it might be a stabbing movement or it might be a hitting movement or you're falling because somebody has you know sort of hit you or something so they, they, they are very typical um movements but there's also some some exercises there's a bit of kung fu and all kinds of other uh, odd things and i think i have altogether around over a hundred different um behaviors and movements and these are just randomly chosen. So every time you go into a locker, uh, you may see, you'll see the same couple always, uh, but they'll be doing different things every time. Um, so you can just go from one locker into the other and always discover them doing something something else in a repetitively. I don't know. I just thought it was a somewhat uh, poetic uh, uh, meditation on uh, our current condition. Uh, our sort of uh, COVID um, uh, uh, related ambience and um, we do have and interesting we times. <laughs> we really do live in interesting times. <laughs> it, yeah. So the locker. Well, anyway, they're in there. The end. Uh, Any time you open a door, you'll find them uh, doing their thing. Um, <laughs> I, must, I must I must say at, at a certain you know at that time when I when we built this work you know there was still a kind of a little bit of a lightness to um this you know sort of our our relationship to uh to quarantine but recently it's become much more um oppressive you know because of the whole, whole uh, micron sort of phenomena and quarantine here now is really very rigorous and uh and uh, quite absolute. And um, I think Sarah and I haven't seen each other for for at least a year. And she can't even come into Hong Kong as, as a non-resident. And if I come back to Hong Kong, I've got to go into three-week quarantine every time. So it's uh, it's quite a challenge. So this safe house is, <laughs> is, is a little, you know, gets a bit more, uh, uh, gets a little Biograph heavier. By a lot biographical. <laughs> yeah. uh, biographical comment on the current situation i guess yeah, yeah. um yeah the it's changing the world um what we're going through right now is changing how we see art how we interpret our what our version of art is to me it's all art has always been a um you know the the mirror of society uh, and the current situation globally it's, it's an anthropological view of 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 the world um that's what we're showing with with safe house uh basically we're we're seeing the covid virus on top the separation of individuals uh without access to each other um in in, in those little lockers uh, it and it's all done with new yeah. media art. Yeah. Um, at the same time, technology is yeah. available. At the same time, I don't like. I, I don't want to be too literal. I don't want to be illustrative, and I want to make something a little, you could say, dada out of it. Yeah. So there is a certain uh, absurdity to this locker cabinet too, which I think is uh, appropriate. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll leave that as it is. Um, what was next for you? How did uh, how did Fall Again Fall Better? Because Fall Again Fall, fall Better, uh, this this work, it's it's not a 2020 thing. It's a 2012, 2019, 2020. So there's multiple iterations of yeah. it. Um, yeah, this work also has a has a you know has a sort of lineage. Um, 
I suppose it goes back quite strongly to a work Sarah and made called uh, Unmakeable Love, uh, which I think was the first time where we actually worked with uh, motion capture data uh, and, uh, and worked with uh, human figures, motion capture human figures and created a, um, you could say, a virtual world populated by humans, yeah, mm. rather rather than golden golden cows. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so it's in a way uh, a figurative work, and uh, and and of course, the history of art is a is a history of, of oscillation between figuration and abstraction. And uh, and our work also does you know oscillates between those two um, those two um, directions um, and um, and also unmakeable love was strongly influenced by uh, our uh, interest in Samuel Beckett's work and uh, the sense that there was a an overlap, a strong overlap between um, Beckett's sort of vision, but also uh, Beckett's um, descriptive process, the way he describes uh, uh, circumstances. Basically, his descriptions can be transformed into, uh, you could say, algorithms, into, into uh, scripts which then can control um, virtual world. So you can, you can create a kind of bridge between uh, Beckett's writing and, um, and um, automated uh, virtual worlds. Um, that's fascinating. Yeah, that, that's, that embody, um, you, you would say, the, the, these, these scripts. Um, that's fascinating, the link you made between yeah. a written work to a new media work. That's yeah. fascinating. So for, again, for better, um, trying to go back to its genesis. Oh, yeah, it was, there was an invitation to do an installation at uh, the Shanghai Biennale. That was the first opportunity that was offered. And... Um, It tied, let's say, again, I don't remember exactly what all the threads were that came together, yeah. but certainly an important one was the the, the Beckett um, phrase, you know, fall, fall again, fall better. Uh, and uh, the fact that this had become such an ubiquitous um, uh, term, I mean, I, I think, I don't know, if you want to do something quite, <laughs> you want to have a peculiar experience yourself, you need to Google on fall again fall better tattoo and okay. then you, okay and then you'll see how many people you won't you won't believe how many people have tattooed that phrase onto their body right including this famous tennis star who has tattooed it onto his tennis arm so every time he sort of hits the ball you know it's fall again fall better <laughs> But it's a it's a great phrase for our time, uh, especially because uh, all around us everything is falling and failing. It's fail again, fail better. Okay, okay. so Beckett's phrase is fail again, fail better, and this is a kind of uh, just a, a reflection of that because falling and failing are sort of like you know closely uh, aligned, They're related. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, y you know and. Uh, so, in a failing world, <laughs> okay, that we're increasingly failing, uh, some sort of image of uh, of um, of um, I don't know of uh, still being able to get up on your feet, not be knocked. I mean, we are being knocked down all the time. You know, every time you open the newspaper, somebody's going to knock you yes. down. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, terrible at the moment um, in every respect. So fall again, fall better. It's, it's just there to somehow um, both acknowledge uh, our disastrous situation, but at the same time, 
Um, so it's there's something. Look, I mean, this sounds a bit. Uh, it's I'm putting it in a somewhat simplistic way, but let's put it. Let me just simply say, on one extreme, you have the fallen in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. and on the other extreme, you have Buster Keaton who's falling all the time and we're laughing our hearts out at that, right? So we're, we are traumatized by the, by f the falling and we are at the same time laughing at falling. And falling is, uh, you know, as we worked with this work a number of times in different iterations, we realized how, um, in a way, fundamental the whole um, uh, physiology of falling is. Because actually falling, in a way, bookends our lives, everybody's life. You know, you, you start off as a baby. On, all on, the time. Falling all the time. But you are falling, and that falling is an extremely positive falling because it's in the falling that you learn to walk, that you learn to get up. One fall after another is the learning process that leads you to be able to stand on your two feet and become, you know, human for the rest of your life, become a human person. Yeah. So we start, we start falling. We begin our lives falling, and then we end our lives falling. But that's a totally different kind of falling. Yeah, the falling of the elderly is a falling which is very threatening. It's the falling which can lead not to getting up, but to, you know, to breaking bones. And also, it's a falling that signals, you know, the, in a way, the last fall, the fall you're not going to get up from, you know, your final fall. So falling, I realize, is very, you know, there's something very, and so we laugh about falling. We laugh at kids falling, you know. There's something, and we are, and we are traumatized by watching eld the elderly falling. And, of course, and we're... And we are traumatized also by all the fallings that come from violence, yeah, and come from killing. And, um, and at the same time, we are always amused by the, you know, the, the comedic falling by, the, you know, by Chaplin, by Keaton, by all the comedians that all the, there's so many times you can slip on a banana. <laughs> the, the, the physical uh, actors, the physical comedians. Uh, yeah. There's a mastery of movement and mastery of their own bodies yeah. um, that sometimes is not appreciated. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, there's a well, not necessarily that new, but it's it's fairly new trend in, in modern dance where um, it, there's a spectacularly you know a uh, spectacular uh, dance troupe out of um, uh, Israel that uh, the, the director, the creative director uh, is teaching them how to fall. That's one of the things that yeah. that they were doing it. And it's it's almost impossible uh, for the normal human to to fall um, mm. on purpose. Mm. You know you fall because you fall because you slipped on something and you know I fell this past weekend because it was slippery and I actually fell mm. but it was not the gracious fall <laughs> that they would teach you to, like you know as a child you, you have as a gracious fall and you, you fall because you you fall but it it takes training and unlearning to fall yeah yeah um so falling is somehow very uh, i mean it's it, it's a, it's it's just somehow very fundamental and, and in a way it enables this particular artwork to have a strong life of its own and to allow us to make new iterations of the work because it has this uh, this power yeah this uh, this um, this uh, very strong set of associations um, and then in the actual making of the work, making it as an interactive work, making it as a work where you as a viewer cause these people to fall and you also cause them to rise up. In other words, it's such a simple interaction. And uh, in a way, it uh, it encapsulates, you know, the, the essence of interactivity in the sense that you step on a mat 
And by stepping on the mat, the weight of your body causes those people to fall. And then when you step off the mat, you release the mat from the weight of your body and they rise up. So you are the agency of their fall. You are the agency of their rising up. It's a, it's a kind of, I don't know, it, it's... Poetic. Um, it, it, and it's also, you know, the tragedy of your being the agent of their fall. Yeah. yeah. And also the the um, the relief or the release or the... the, the uh, being the agent of somebody rising up as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's let's also... Play <laughs> let's play it. Let's, 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 let's look at it a little bit. And let's face it, it's also a little dada, a little uh, absurd. It's a little bit theater of the absurd bit. because still we're living in absurd times. Um, now, the figures fall in a very somewhat unusual way. Um, and this is also a very fundamental aspect of the aesthetic of this work. Their feet because never move. Because they don't fall like you would normally fall if you were a, if you were a living person and you fell, you couldn't fall like this, and that's because um, their skeleton is not a true human skeleton. It's a push puppet. Do you know what a push puppet is? It's one of those, if, yeah, little toys. You know, yeah, a, a little string toy. You have a, a figure. Or a, it can be a, a horse or a dog. Can be a figure. And it's it's held together by strings, and when you push, you know, the button underneath, the strings go loose, and the figure collapses. And so, actually, as a kid, we were playing with fall again, fall better. We were playing with this push puppet, yeah. watching them fall, watching them hop up again, fall, hop up. So it's the same fascination, the same you know obsession that you are causing them, this figure to fall, to pop up. So these figures are also modeled as push puppets, uh, and they fall like push puppets, which means they fall in, in, in a very disjointed uh, way. Uh, and actually that disjointedness of the way they fall, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but it has another conceptual and aesthetic thread because if a human body just falls, even if you are shot, right, uh, and fall, or even if you die and fall, you won't fall like that, right? No, the, no, the no. Resu the resulting um, figure The human the body ground. doesn't act like that. Yeah. So, you know. But there is one condition where you will see bodies in this state, and that is that once they are dead, yeah, and thrown, for instance, onto uh, a heap. You know, uh, in other words, once they have lost their life and are then handled in one way or another, they can take these grotesque shapes, right? There's, and again, there's no again, tension in the body, right? Once, once exactly, once exactly. So again, it has maybe well, it should have a certain resonance with one's memory of. Uh, of you know when one see heaps of, of a heap of dead bodies that have been thrown together either yeah, for one situation or another uh, um, one one catastrophic situation or another so there's that aspect to them and there's another aspect to this work which is also very very uh, fundamental and that is that um, there's a certain algorithm which is controlling how they fall. And um, basically, there's a, a random factor in that, so that when each figure starts to fall, there's a random factor as to which direction they will fall. And there's also then a random factor of how they will bump into other people who are falling. So as soon as you trigger their fall, there is a random set of variables that come into play which means that when they fall, they fall in a completely, um, you could say, idiosyncratic way or a completely unique way. What I'm getting at is the fact that each fall of this group of people is a unique event, which will never, 
ever be be repeated. Yeah. Now, there's something a little paradoxical about that because, on the one hand, all these figures are generic. You know, they're they're somehow a yeah. uh, generic, not really truly um, gender specific, uh, and also, you know, they 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 could be anything. That they don't. They're not anybody in particular, right? They're everybody. Right. But the way they fall, every one of these figures, when they fall, falls in a completely individual, unique way that will never repeat itself. So, I mean, if you would step on that mat a million times, you will watch a million different configurations, a million, let's say, sc different sculptures of yeah. heaps of bodies. So each event is a, I don't know how to say, is a, a unique event that you, as the person Observer. who's... But you've caused this event. Yeah, you've caused a unique moment of you could say of collapse of destruction of this group of figures. And at the same time, you you let them rise to fall again another time. Um, so this is an important uh, aspect to the work because it's also, in a kind of perverse way. Uh, a you could call it a sculpture making machine because you are basically building a unique sculpture of bodies yeah. uh, every time you step on that mat a unique configuration of bodies i don't know all of this for me is makes the work somehow resonate on a on a level of importance because indeed uh, when we think of all the the death that surrounds us, if we think of a number, six million, we cannot imagine an identity, a single identity in such big numbers. And in a yeah. way, the the um, the uh, how say the the non-identity of these figures represents the non-identity of all these big numbers, and yet. The fact that in that moment of fall, they will only fall like that and never again. Well, you yeah. then establish the clarity that these people have fallen, these specific people have fallen, and it's a specific moment in history. <laughs> of, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then a new set of people yeah. have fallen. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's a bit morbid, Jeffrey. Just to... Yes, but... Um, <laughs> You know, there's a whole history of, of I mean, I, I feel that this work links to a history of art, you know, like Picasso's Guernica. Yes. Or, or um, there are many, many, you know, artists who have actually, you know, tried to acknowledge, you know, the horror, you know, it, uh, and um, I don't know, it's also a work in the, in the you could say, in, in the world of, uh, of um, apocalypse now, yeah, of... Uh, of that movie, and it also yeah. res it also resonates with this double. It's 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 a two edged thing, and and indeed it's it's this terrible, you know, life and death paradox of the bookends. <laughs> the the it, but it's yes, it's the bookends, the falling of the you know, but it's it's an everyday occurrence, and it's it's so now, but it's also always. Yeah. Um, Civilization as we are right now, we're we're here because of all these people that have brought us here that are no longer with us that have fallen for us to yeah. get up to, yeah. to do a better job. Um, well, not a better job because I don't know better in terms of what, um, but to advance you know humanity a little bit forward. Um, yeah. And it, it, it is morbid but it's it's a fact of life um it, it's something in, in in this case yes we're i think were you thinking about more on the um, the covid situation um not at that time but of course now it becomes uh, pertinent and in fact there are so many things going on at the moment that make it pertinent yeah. currently we have the work showing in germany um there's a, a projection triennale 
and we were asked to do projection on an enormous wall surface. It's 250 meters long, 10 meters high. Wow. Wow. And uh, of course, to do something interactive on that scale doesn't make sense anymore because a single person interaction with something on that scale doesn't make sense. So it just had to be something that stands on its own. And we ended up doing a, a version of Fall Again, Fall Better, where these groups of people now, um, there are now 20 groups over 250 meters. And they now fall like dominoes. So the first group falls, and then the next group falls, the next group falls. And they fall in a sort of domino effect all the way down over the length of 250 meters. And then they all simultaneously rise up to fall again. And I don't know, again, it just felt like this is the most appropriate work that one could make today, yeah, in terms of of expressing our um, despair, <laughs> yeah, and the also too. and also the absurdity of this of our of of what is causing our despair, right? You know, the domino effect of our despair, the the the, the, the domino effect of all the stupidity that is uh, that is just accelerating uh, um, the you know the. the the disasters around us and at the same time you know this moment of relief when they all rise up again and um so that uh, there is a sense that still maybe <laughs> there is some oh, hope <laughs> please oh. but, it, but it's also crazily enjoyable i mean so maybe one can take a slightly buddhist point of view and just simply say well it's all okay, somehow or other. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, and it's it's more about acceptance, right? Within yeah. uh, the Buddhist framework, it, it would be, it, it is what it is, right? It's, it's and, and the Stoics would say the same thing. Uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah. And and for us to, to, to yeah. accept life, it's we yeah. have to accept it the way it is. Um, and, that's, and let's face it, if we think of all those wonderful you know, sort of medieval and Renaissance paintings, which we enjoy so much, where we see the <laughs> tortures of hell, right? And we are so much, and you know, where it's clear that uh, the artist is reveling, you know, in the... Uh, in the torture. In, in the, Well, in, in the way in which the torture can offer itself to a kind of aesthetic you know, expansion of the imagination, right? Thank you, Dante, uh, for, for yeah. that vision yeah. of the... <laughs> so we understand what it means to sort of dip our feet into the into the, into the 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 horror and somehow enjoy it too. I don't know how that works exactly. <laughs> let's stay with the hope and uh, let's let's finish it on the on a joyous uh, hope uh, feeling. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about what's in store for you uh, in terms of uh, work. What are you working on that's exciting you? Um, and what are you proposing? Uh, what are you thinking about proposing? Oh, there's a, th a few things going on at the moment. Uh, both Sarah and I are working here on a number of projects for the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Um which uh, all have um, certain charm. They they certainly leverage a lot of the the uh, um, um, work we've done in the past and and take it you know develop it in new directions. Um, some experiments with interactivity and with mixed reality, um, with trying to create an even more ambiguous border between our being in the real world and the beings in the virtual world and way and the way in which not just two spaces are kind of conjoined are, or interpenetrate like the Dunhuan cave you know the Dunhuan cave mm -hmm. as a space which co exists in the real space so the two spaces are conjoined but also creating a uh, indeed a, a virtual environment which is configured with um, 
living creatures, in this case, uh, horses. <laughs> Because we're getting horses. away from the cows. <laughs> yeah, no, horses are very important in the history of uh, Chinese culture, and um, and the, so we are working in the direction of creating a kind of um, dynamic uh, interaction between viewers and represented uh, um, horses. I won't go into more detail about that That's at right. the moment. Um, but there are a number. There are a number of projects which overlap. Let's say our, our interest in cultural heritage, with yeah. also our sort of let's say artistic uh, uh, sort of obsessions, um, and I'm also um, hoping there will be an opportunity to pick up on a on a work which I did ages ago, uh, the Legible City, um, which is a work which was made uh, goes back to 1989. Now, legible city, you know, is bicycling through virtual world of, of virtual cities that where the buildings are replaced by text, and we've built a virtual we've built a legible city for Manhattan, a virtual city for um, Amsterdam, and one for Karlsruhe. Um, hmm. This was, these were done during 1989, 1990, 1991. Karlsruhe is in German, yes. Amsterdam is in Dutch. Manhattan is in English, but they all use, of course, um, you know, um, Roman characters, you know, sort of, uh, and it, it was always in the back of my mind, uh, a sort of interest to th imagine that I would make a legible city uh, for an Asian country uh, where I could use Chinese characters uh, so that one would explore an urban environment that was built out of Chinese characters. And it seems there is an opportunity um, that's emerging here in Hong Kong to do a legible city for Hong Kong. And I've, I've already identified a writer that I would like to work with. And um, we've done some experiments, uh, you know, sort of populating some streets with, nice. um, with these Chinese characters. And it looks really great. So, um, and for me, it is something uh, important about this work because, you know, I lived 10 years in Amsterdam and we have the legible city for Amsterdam. I lived 10 years in Karlsruhe and the legible city of Karlsruhe is somehow the, you know, somehow a, a, an expression of that. And now I've also lived here for over 10 years. So it feels like so time. Yeah, it feels like a, an interesting sort of a circulation of a work that somehow expresses my uh, um attachment to a place and can express my attachment to a place. Um, so I'm look, quite looking forward to that. It, it, they all sound fantastic projects and I'm looking forward to seeing them. Um, it, so, uh, but for today, I wanted to really thank you for your time. And because yes, we've, I'm, I'm privileged to have had so much of your time today. I really appreciate it. And for sure. taking us through, thank you for taking us through the, the evolution of, of your work, and well, at least some of your work, um, mm. and how AR has changed and mm. how it's evolving, and and what that means, and especially in the in the uh, in the in the framework of of, of deep fakes behind me, um, how all of that is just becoming accessible and uh, to the public and and interactive, like we're calling it interactive because that's what it is, but we're influencing uh, the works and. It, this this interaction is 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 so extraordinary because it brings the audiences in, it, it makes them engage with and and participate and yeah. um and and it's 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 visible and in the visitors when you're when you're seeing them uh, pick up the objects and, and interact and uh, yeah, so so uh, Jeffrey, I want to say a huge thank you for today. Thank you Pleasure. for your time, and uh, I want to say also thank you to everyone that's joined us for the for the video and invite them to check your your uh, information at the bottom of like at the you know with the website with the uh, video we'll have a link to your work and 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 to the exhibition. So thank you again to to Jeffrey and to everyone that was watching. Uh, this is Monica and Toki with uh, EPFL Pavilions and we're talking about in conversation for Deepfakes Art and its Double with its curator lead. Um, with Kira, Sarah, Canadine, and uh, we'll see you guys in Lausanne until May 1st, 2022. Thanks, Absolutely. everyone. Thank Thanks, Monica. Thanks so much, too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.